Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first webinar of this new series for Iberia Parish, Up Next. This series will be tailored to keeping Iberia Parish residents and business owners updated and will offer you all some great networking opportunities. Before we begin, I'd like to mention a few technical housekeeping rules. Your microphones and cameras will remain turned off for the entire program. If you have a question for one of our panelists, please send it through the chat here on Zoom, and we will get through as many as we can during the last 10 minutes of the webinar. After the webinar is over, the conversation will continue on Slack, a messaging platform designed for you all to connect with each other and share information that might help others navigate the path forward. There will be a few documents covered during today's webinar, including some additional resources that you might find helpful. Every document we discuss here, including helpful links and information for joining our Slack group, will be listed at iberiachamber.org slash up next. Go there right now to join our Slack group and to find resources that we will cover in this webinar. Lastly, the staff and board of the chamber want to extend our gratitude to all of you for joining us today. These have been an extraordinary few months for our parish and the state, and everyone here today, including those of you watching the recording of this webinar, will be the reason that Iberia Parish thrives in this path forward. Let's get on with the program. Today, we will be joined by Annie Bell with the Chamber Board of Directors, Lenny Fields and Amy Landry, both with Iberia Bank, Prescott Marshall with the Iberia Parish Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness, Jade Buto with Shadows on the Tesh, and Kay and Broussard with Sweet Interiors. It is my pleasure to introduce our first panelist, Ms. Annie Bell, to recap the past few months of the Chamber work here in the parish. Take it away, Annie. Good morning. Um, my name is Annie Bell, and I'm proud to be a member of the Greater Iberia Chamber of Commerce. I wanted to uh, just let everyone know how the uh, Greater Iberia Chamber of Commerce pivoted over the course of this time. And from the day that the Chamber closed its doors to the public, the Chamber staff kicked into overdrive to bring business owners and Iberia Parish residents timely and succinct information. Um, part of the challenge during the crises such as these is the tremendous volume of information that is coming in from multiple sources. The chamber staff made it their top priority to catch and comb through as much of the information as they could uh, and clarify and deliver it um, back to the community um, with uh, preciseness. As the chamber returned back to the office in late May, we achieved the following while working uh, remotely. We promoted day-to-day -day business changes of over 180 local businesses. We made 250, uh, over 250 one-on-one -on -one, uh, calls to the local businesses uh, and Iberia Parish business owners. We advocated for three efforts in the state legislature. We sent 20 newsletters containing timely and critical and succinct information. We deferred dues for over 95 members, ensuring th those businesses of our continued chamber support for them. We posted over 75 times to the cha chamber's Facebook to share important up updates with over 30,000 impressions. We posted resources to the website with over 2,224 2, unique page views of those resources between early March all the way through May. Of course, now the webinar is another way that we can continue to support our members and offer guidance to the public. How many new members in 2020? 26 new members. We're excited about that. You can call the chamber to join uh, while these webinars and all the resources listed on our website are made available to the public. There's a world of benefits that the chamber membership can offer you and your business. If you wanna talk membership, you head over to our website, which is iberiachamber.org, and you will see uh, the option to become a member. Or you can send us an email at info at iberiachamber.org. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for that recap, Annie Bell. We're gonna go ahead now over 
to Miss Lenny Fields. She is the uh, she is with Iberia Bank, and she's going to lead our discussion on financial resiliency. Hey, Lenny. Hello. How's everybody today? My name's Lenny Fields. I'm with Iberia Bank. I have been working for Iberia Bank for over 20 years now, and I have been a member of the board for the Chamber of Commerce for the past three years, and I enjoy every minute of it. Today, I'm going to briefly discuss um, about business and commercial loans. We do offer a variety of business and commercial products, uh, commercial loan products at Iberia Bank. So come see us um, if you have a need for a business or a commercial loan. I also do consumer loans, but generally I focus on business and commercial loans. The amount will be ranging from $10,000 to millions of dollars. Um, the requirements that we ask from the client, depending on the amount of the loan, we normally start with two year tax returns and a completed personal financial statement. Um, Avery will show our contact um, number uh, in the middle of the show or at the end of the show. So come visit us at Iberia Bank. I'll give you the floor to back to Avery. Awesome, Lenny. Uh, thank you for covering that and introducing the financial resiliency. And so for everyone watching, um, just so you know, uh, all of those documents that we discuss here today, including contact information for Iberia Bank and all financial institutions within the parish are um, available at iberiachamber.org slash up next. You'll see a listing for today's webinar and you can find all the resources there. Now, to continue with our financial resiliency chat, we're gonna go over to Ms. Amy Landry. Hi, Amy. Hi, uh, my name is Amy Landry and uh, I am the Assistant Branch Manager here with Iberia Bank. Um, I have been with Iberia Bank uh, for seven years, counting the time uh, that I was with Tesh Federal. So, um, in addition to your lending, your business lending needs, we do have great business checking and savings products here um, and i'm going to share a little bit of what is required to um, start a business checking and savings account with iberia bank so um, of course we need the legal documentation issued by the secretary of state based on your entity type we will also require the confirmation of ein or a tin letter from the irs and a minimal of a hundred dollar deposit to get the account started now these requirements are those of iberia bank um, other banks may vary as far as what they require back to you avery awesome amy thank you for that and i just want to ask you know over the past few months of uh working with iberia bank and these businesses what has it been like in terms of maybe an influx in uh these checking accounts being opened or maybe a decrease well, Avery, I am located at uh, what is considered a very busy branch here. And honestly, with the COVID, um, our business, as far as uh, people requesting check business checking and savings accounts, kind of remains steady because we were able to offer um, online assistance as far as opening checking and savings accounts. And for those um, clients who are existing, um, in with personal checking or savings accounts we handled a lot of things over the phone so we basically did anything necessary to help those clients um, during these times that's awesome and just one last question for you what is one of the biggest challenges that you've seen not only for yourself helping these businesses out but for these businesses as well if there's one important piece that you want people uh, watching the webinar today to take home with them what is that Yes, just make sure that you receive your documentation from the Secretary of State and the IRS because um, when coming into the branch to open the, the business check-in or savings account, we're going to need that at the time of account opening. And uh, if we do not have that information, there will be some delays with getting the account started. Awesome. Amy, I wanna thank you for joining us today. And thank everyone you. at home, if you have any questions for our panelists here, for Ms. Amy Landry or for um, Ms. Linney, 
field of Iberia Bank, make sure to send that question in the Zoom group chat here on Zoom, and we'll get to those at the end of the program. Thanks again, Amy. Thank you. Now we're gonna go over to Ms. Jay Buto with Shadows on the Tesh, a little place you might've heard of before. And we're gonna talk to her about their recent pivot with the plein air art competition and how they switched over to an online auction recently. Take it away, Jade. Thanks, Avery. Um, so before we start, I wanna apologize if you hear my dog, he's in a barking mood today. Um, so for the 2020 Shadows in the Trash Plein Air competition, we were actually already planning on selling paintings completed by the juried artist online. And we were gonna do that through Bidding for Good. Um, and they help schools, nonprofits, charities, and for-profit organizations running charity auctions increase their fundraising revenue. Uh, Bidding for Good also has a yearly subscription fee uh, to utilize the platform and then a small percentage fee per transaction. And we were willing to incur these additional costs and fees because we thought it would be a great addition to the event. And we were actually pretty excited um, to see how it would turn out based on the positive feedback that we had received from the artists and other people that have been involved with the event. And so this decision, to offer online sales would prove crucial once the competition was canceled due to COVID. Uh, and so unfortunately, by the time the cancellation decision was made, we already had about four or five artists in town. Um, they had all competed before and they decided to spend a few days painting in the area as they were already here. And it was through conversations with them that we decided to shift gears and rather than sell artwork that was done only in 2020, we would sell artwork that was done over the entire six year history of the competition. It would be a way to fundraise for shadows uh, and as a nonprofit, that's always important. Um, but it would also provide income for these artists. And at this time in March, it was looking to be a slower competition year for them. Uh, and it would provide us with a chance to test whether the selling online thing was even going to be successful. Um, basically, it was a win-win for everyone involved. And so over the next eight days, um, we contacted previous artists to see if we could include their work in the sale, began promoting the online sale via press releases, social media, and our newsletter. We uploaded all of this information into the online platform and then launched the sale. We promoted the sale throughout its two month run and we actually sold about a dozen or so paintings, raising money that we wouldn't have otherwise. And also proving that expanding into online sales was a pretty good decision. And so for us, I think that there were three takeaways from this experience. So we are a small staff at Shadows. We're a full-time staff of three, uh, but we were able to shift quickly with a lot of hard work and coordination. I'd also like to point out that the event's cancellation coincided with our move to remote work, uh, which was already difficult enough on its own, much less trying to organize a new event with only emails and phone calls. Uh, and the community, so number two, the community continued to support us and our artists during this time. Even though the more active community engagement couldn't happen, the event typically includes an art talk, a couple of demos, painting on Main Street, and a reception, all of which were canceled due to COVID. Um, but our first sales right out of the gate were all from local people. And then three, the success of our online pivot uh, is a testament to the following that the event has received and the personal connections that have been made over the past six years uh, between both the community and the artist. And in fact, the idea that morphed into the online sale was initially proposed by an artist who was more concerned about how the event's cancellation would affect our fundraising ability than about the fact that 
he wasn't going to be able to make any sales and therefore you know that would hurt his income for the year as well. That is a very inspiring story, Jade. I can only assume that that was a huge undertaking for you and for everyone who needed to come together to make that event happen. And so uh, what was the turnout? How did it uh, go in the end? Yeah, so was, uh, we sold over a dozen paintings. Um, and so that was really good at, uh, because we wouldn't have sold any otherwise. Um, and we had really great feedback from the artists who had been part of the online sale. And so it's something that we are excited to implement um, in 2021 for our competition that year. Um, and hopefully it'll have, you know, paintings that uh, from all the artists that were juried in at that time. That's really great, Jade. And so what are some challenges or questions that came about as you guys were preparing for this event that perhaps you hadn't anticipated? So I assume this would tie in to your takeaways, but what was maybe one of the bigger hurdles that you want people to be aware of? Um, well, I guess that for us, you know, uh, this was like, so the event was canceled on the Friday, and by the following week, we had, we launched this online sale. Um, and so just kind of coordinating all of that in the midst of closing the site and moving to remote work and trying to figure out what that looked like for us. Um, it was difficult, but it was, but like in the end, doable um, with a lot of additional communication. Um, and just everyone that's part of the committee just wanting to see this actually happen. Awesome. Jade, I want to uh, thank you so much for inspiring us with Shadows on the Tesh's uh, story of their pivot for this online auction. Thank you. Very welcome. And we're going to go over now to Ms. Kayan Broussard with Sweet Interiors. Hey, Kayan. Hi everyone, um, I'm Kayan Broussard. I am Sweet Interiors, newest employee. Um, new in Sweet Interiors is a interior decor boutique on Main Street, Iberia, owned by my mother-in-law, Waltine Broussard. If you'd have told me nine years ago that I'd be working for my mother-in-law, I'd have said you were crazy. Um, it was established in 2011 and for the past nine years, their revenue has solely depended on their brick and mortar storefront and um, depending on people just walking into the store, very traditional marketing. Um, so then quarantine came about and the stay at home order and my mother-in-law was going stir crazy and she was just in her store one day to get out the house. I was dropping off Sylvie going um, grocery shopping at the time and she shows me her phone and it's a video of one of her wholesalers from out of state that um, was selling kind of like shadows for their vendors is what she was doing on a much, much larger scale and says, look at this, why can't I do that? And so I said, I don't know, why can't you? And her response was, oh, I can't get on camera like that. I can't sell online. And so my response to that was, you want me to do it? I'll do it. And at that moment, insert foot in mouth because she said, yes, next week, we're going to do it next week. And um, so we kind of discussed a few things. We had our first argument about what time um, of day would be the best time to go live on Facebook. She suggested 10 o'clock, 10 a.m. was good. And I looked at her like she was crazy. Like, who's going to shop at 10 o'clock in the morning? Um, I'm a, a night owl. If I can go shopping at nine and 10 o'clock at night, I would. Um, so my suggestion was six. And we went back and forth and back and forth until I finally said, you know what? We're not even going to argue about this. And I created a survey monkey and asked her, posted it on Facebook, asking her customers and what time of day would be best with a few other questions. And I think our options were 10, 2, and 6. And I posted it on a Friday. And by the Monday, we only had one response, which was our aunt. <laughs> and at that point, I was very, very nervous and thinking, okay, I don't know how we're going to do this. I'm not going live for two people. 
how am I going to get people um, involved and engaged and make this a success? Um, and I have no business in marketing experience. I am a pre-K teacher by trade. I teach dancing. I have no social media following um, of any sort. So this was all very new to me. I started researching, advertising, um, Facebook Live, um, watching other people who had been successful and what I liked that they did, what I didn't want to do, or what what I could and couldn't do, what would be make our successful and what we could accomplish or capable, capable of um, to make it our own kind of thing. So um, I started the, you know, tag three friends and share. And do y'all know it works? It, it definitely works. <laughs> um, I'm not one to participate very much in that, but it works. Um, so any other businesses doing that is great. Um, so by the Friday, May 1st was our first live sale and we hopped on, went live on Facebook and we had 40 people watching that night. We sold, we didn't sell all 20 items, we sold many and if people didn't purchase through the sale, they saw it, they watched it and then they came into the store or called the next day and said, hey, I saw this on Facebook. Can I, can I purchase it, you know, online or by phone? And we did a curbside pickup for those who didn't want to come into the store or were still, you know, really following the stay-at-home order. Um, so it was so successful that I kept on researching, like what was going to make people stay engaged? And I know consistency is key, having a hashtag that people would, um, associate with the store. We argued again about which hashtag to use. Um, and we, we went with the Watch Us Wednesday and it stuck and people look forward to it. Um, we didn't want to burn ourselves out either. And so we did every other week, some are recorded, some are live. Um, so it's been a great, great success. And the most we've, people we've ever had was um, 80, and we've consistently been anywhere from 30 to 40 people purchasing. And it just went from there, and it's taken off. Um, and so we did hit a few roadblocks, and at the beginning, we, how are we going to um, accept payments? Well, she's like, I'm going to need a PayPal and a Venmo. And so I go to create her PayPal, and she didn't have online business banking yet, so we had to call the bank. So just little things like that um, to have your ducks in a row, just little things make a difference. She's very, she was still very traditional with carbon copy, written receipt. Um, and so we didn't change that. I didn't come in and rebrand and say, we were going, everything's gonna be automated or on a computer. She still kept her, the way they did business, but we just added something new. And so we do accept PayPal, um, and we do invoicing and you can call in and purchase and um, just curbside pickup if you don't have time to come into the store. So it's been a great success. And um, just for those traditional um, small local businesses that aren't, don't have a social media presence yet or don't, don't wanna stop doing the way they've done things for 20 years, or longer, um, I love tradition. I love those things that, the places that you bring your baby to buy their first shoes, the places that you go to buy your birthday cake. You know, Gidry's Cake Shop is, um, was established by Waltine's mother and is now run by her sister, Simi, and her um, niece, Madison, and they're doing a great job. They've also pivoted and made a few changes when this happened, and they now serve cupcakes in um, local grocery stores, just to help get their product out there um, during this time. So you don't have to change everything you're doing, just, but there's always something you can add to make it better or try something different. So thank y'all. That's awesome, Kay. And I really, um, we, we love that story. And we wanted to highlight that um, for everyone at home to draw some inspiration from, because contrary to how you see um, Miss Jade was speaking about Shadows on the Tesh and their pivot with, um, what was it, bidding for, bidding for good. Mm -hmm. And so, Kay, and if I understand it, your experience with this pivot and these online auctions has been a largely free 
process. Tell me more right. about that. Um, so I had looked into a few, but I didn't want to have an overhead cost. And what if this didn't even work out? Um, so I started with just, um, we did PayPal, which was just accept the payments, which she already had a credit card machine. So the percentage they take out is about the same or a little bit less than a credit card machine anyhow. Um, so that was the only thing that we're really having overhead cost with. Everything else, uh, we're using a free in invoice generator <laughs> um, that she had come across and I looked at her like she was crazy, but it's working. Um, I'm just saving them on Google Drive. Google Office Drive is amazing um, for small businesses and to network and share things um, with, at the business that you can have on file without having it on paper. Um, then the I've looked into comment sold or other um, platforms for things like that, but the overhead was just too much. So we didn't do it. I have a printed out um, item numbers because I wanted to know what would make it easier for our, our client customers watching the sale to remember the item number because our um, rules for purchasing or to comment the word sold, the item number and your email. And at first they were like, that's too much. That's too much for my people to type in. That's going to be hard. And we stuck with it and they caught on and it's working. Um, so it works out and we didn't even need anything overhead. I do have a item numbers that are printed on photo paper and I have it on an easel. And I realized that when we're videoing, I had to mirror the image. So that took a little, but there anything you need to learn, I Googled it. Like I researched it. I Googled, how do I do this? And it was easy. That's Just awesome, a little Karen. research, a little learning. Definitely. Um, I'm sure everyone can relate to that as we've all had to make adjustments to how we do our work and how we get things accomplished. So Kayan, thank you so much for joining us. Again, that's Kayan from Sweet Interiors. And if you guys have a message for Kayan or for any of our panelists, remember that you can always send our a chat through in our chat window here on Zoom. We also want to remind everyone that all of the resources that have been mentioned here today, including links to the Shadows on the Tesh Plein Air competition for 2021, as well as Sweet Interior's successful Facebook Live auctions, that will all be available at iberiachamber.org slash up next. On that page, you'll see a listing for today's webinar, as well as a link for resources. You'll also be able to find a recording of this webinar at that link as well, and it should be uploaded within the next 24 hours. Now, we're going to head over and speak with Mr. Prescott Marshall, the Director of Iberia Parish Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness. Hi, Prescott. Take it away. Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. Am I still muted? I unmuted. Avery came racing in the door to fix me up. Um, yeah, I actually have two positions. I work for uh, Larry Richard. I am the uh, Parish Government's Emergency Preparedness Director. I'm also the Director of the Iberia Parish Communications District, which is a standalone district like the Sewer District or the Fire District or the Mosquito District. Um, it's funded with all your personal and business phone bills. There's a fee in there that pays for 911. I administer that. Um, I'm pretty proud of the operation we've got going on there. That's technically a separate job. And I'll talk about that a little bit. I find when I do public speaking, I actually get more questions about 911 than I do about hurricanes. I think everybody says, I've been in a hurricane. I want to know about 911. So I'll make sure I did touch on that. Um, the way we manage disasters, we have a command center. Right now it's in the basement of the courthouse. It's not very large. Uh, what we'll do, and I'll use a hurricane as an example, but we've done this for ice storms, we've done this for hazardous materials events. Uh, for a hurricane about five days out, we actually have a five day hour by hour plan, we call it our HR plan. We'll start meeting. And that's about the time that the state, the Governor's Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness and the National Weather Service hold calls. So what you would see if you were with us, we'd have a meeting, we typically have the mayor's, the legal advisor, fire district, the sheriff's office, uh, parish president, and uh, we'll get the latest weather briefing. The governor's office will give them a briefing, and we'll tell the governor's office what our status is. And 
if you look at our HR sequence, you'll see as obviously you get closer, you have bigger and bigger steps. Right now, our, our target, if we had to do a mandatory evacuation, our target for that is H minus 60, which is two and a half days before landfall. These are really hard decisions to make because on the one hand, if you wait too long, it's too late to put people on the road. Uh, but at two and a half days out, you're kind of wondering, is this storm going to go somewhere else? And we understand there's a major impact on businesses. I'll give you a good example. Uh, nursing homes are legally obligated to move, to leave and evacuate if we declare mandatory evacuation. And that's, that's a risky uh, evolution for a nursing home to take with their patients. So at any rate, at any rate my point is we've got a very structured uh, timeline to make sure we don't fall behind as the storm gets closer and closer. Um, Post storm, we have a whole sequence of events as well. It would make everybody's eyes glaze over if I went through it. But basically, we have a number of steps we take to make sure the parish, uh, the parish's damages are captured and we become eligible for any federal assistance that's available. Um, I would just add, uh, I mentioned uh, ice storms. Y'all probably remember about five years ago, we had two back-to-back -back ice storms. And I remember sitting down at our meeting thinking, well, I didn't plan for ice storms. I guess I'm a pretty screwed up emergency preparedness director. But the plan that we had and the group that comes together for these events at the parish and the municipality level, it worked great. It, we used the same plan. We had a lot of different questions. Um, you know, freeways were getting closed everywhere. The overpasses and Highway 90 were closed. Everybody needed to know what the schools were doing. Well, the schools were with us. So the, this integrated command structure that we have uh, has served us well in a number of different events. You know, who'd ever think we had to worry about a nice storm shutting down the Basin Bridge? And uh, what we found is that the plan we have and the relationships we've built worked really well for that. Um, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about hurricanes. Everybody here knows about hurricanes. I'll touch on forecasts, though. Um, one thing that I try and enforce in our operations center is we really try not to pay attention to other forecasts besides the National Weather Service. I'm a huge fan of the National Weather Service. Um, what we see happen is you get these, inflammatory is not the right word, but these dramatic forecasts that are floating around the internet. Um, and the one message I would just give everybody is if you're making decisions about yourself, your family, or your business, uh, base that decision on what the Weather Service is telling you. And that's what we do. That's an uh, ironclad rule for us. Um, there are people out there that seem to do it for clicks. They want the most dramatic forecast. Uh, we make a habit of staying away from them. Um, one tool that we've added, and hey, Avery, I don't know if you can do this, and I apologize. I didn't think about this till uh, just before I came in here. But if people go to the Iberia Parish Government homepage, at the very bottom, there's a button for Iberia PINS, which is Parish Information Notification System. It's a really powerful uh, notification system. If you sign up, we can push texts to your cell phones. We can push uh, recorded messages to your home or business phones. Uh, my commitment to everyone here is we are not going to spam you. Um, we have a debate periodically about how often should we use this system. We got good use out of it uh, last year during Hurricane Barry. So I would just encourage everyone on the call to go to the Iberia Parish Government homepage. If you go to the bottom, there's a button for Iberia Pins. And if you sign up, again, my promise to you is we will not spam you, but what we find is it, it becomes difficult to put out information quickly on things like, say, we declare a mandatory evacuation. Everybody really needs to know that. Now, we'll also put out information. We have an Iberia Parish Government Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness Facebook page. And we have a lot of success with that. Um, but we don't want to count just on, on Facebook. So I would encourage everyone to sign up for the Iberia PIN system. It's... Uh, it, we've had a lot of success with it, um, and you can only, you can sign up to get messages the way you want, the mechanism you want. If you just want the text, just sign up for that. Um, from a business perspective, uh, I'll just give a couple of uh, lessons learned that we've seen. We had a hazmat event a few years ago, and there was a business right across the street, and they were forced to evacuate, like in a hurry, like running down the street, they had to evacuate. Well, and I never thought of this, I'm not a business owner, they couldn't pay their people. About two days later, they, the owner had to get back into his business in order to do his payroll. And he didn't have it backed up anywhere. And fortunately, the winds and the nature of the hazardous material involved were such that 
um, the state police that run hazmat events, were able to escort him into his business so he could snatch his computers and take them away and do his payroll somewhere else. So all that talk about backing up your records really is important. Another friend of mine, uh, uh, building behind his business, caught fire last weekend. Turned out not to be a big fire. And he did have all his information backed up. So I would just tell you, if you've got information you need to pay your people or to maintain your business, back it up offsite and be able to reach it offsite if you need to work with it. Don't have it set up where you have to get back in your business. Like don't have it on a hard drive that's in your desk drawer at your office because that's not going to help you if the building's on fire uh, or if the state police aren't letting you get down your block. Um, there is a document in Avery. Can you show folks the uh, emergency preparedness guide that uh, you posted? Can you yes, I'll go ahead and uh, I'll broadcast the first page of it and I'll direct everyone to iberiachamber.org slash up next. You'll find a link for resources from today's webinar and the emergency preparedness guide will be available there. I'll go ahead and pull that up. Okay, I'll just add while he does that. Everybody keep, comes to our office and they want us to give stuff out about water cleanliness and public health and get your immunizations. I kind of resist that. You know, I don't want to spam the community. But these are, these are excellent. These books are excellent resources. We have them at my office. If you come to the courthouse, we have them in a, a magazine rack outside the front door. And Avery has scanned it here. I'll just point out on page 11 of this document, there's a list of uh, steps you can take as a business owner. Um, I won't go through them again. I've given you the ones that I've witnessed personally about backing up your data. Um, but I would really recommend this document to everybody. It's a pretty high quality document. There's not a lot of uh, junk in it. Um, I refer people to it often. One note I'll bring up for businesses, I was asked, asked about a lot when I took this position about 10 years ago, is reentry. Um, there were storms about 12, we're talking 12, 14 years ago, where the parish uh, put out some fairly onerous reentry conditions. I would tell you that my philosophy is we need business back. We need business open as quickly as possible to recover the community. So if anything, our approach is going to be if there's a block with live wires sparking and jumping around, we will block off that area. But we need our businesses back as quickly as possible. Uh, Mr. Richard agrees with me on this. So if we did have a mandatory evacuation, and one reason to sign up for Iberia Pins is you might be away from here, we'll keep you updated on what the conditions are, and we'll tell you as soon as it's safe to re-enter. But I'll also tell you, you're not going to have roadblocks preventing people from coming back in. Um, if you do that, people just tend not to evacuate again because they figure out if I leave, I might not get back and be able to check on my home or business. So I, I get asked about that periodically. I want to reassure business owners, we need you back uh, as quickly as possible after storm because people need you. Um, one personal tip that would have uh, affected businesses as well. What I tell everybody, and I tell my own family this every time there's a storm in the Gulf, fill up every gas tank you own if there is a hurricane in the Gulf. We had a storm, I think it was in 2011, I can't remember the name. We weren't even affected, but what happened is everybody rushes out to get gas. Uh, gas station owners, they want to minimize their carrying costs. So they don't fill their tanks to the top. And so if every one of us on this call and everyone we knew ran out and filled up our tanks right after this call, there's a chance that probably not is. But if everybody in the parish ran out after this call, we could probably run dry all the gas stations in the parish. And that happened in 2011. At what point, at one point, all the gas stations are out of gas. And that's because the gas stations don't keep their tanks topped off. And then the bulk suppliers, they are only sized for day-to-day -day, uh, business. They're not sized for these surges. So I would tell you personally, and I would tell you from a business perspective, um, don't wait until the storm is close. If there is a hurricane in the Gulf, that's what I tell everyone, and this is what I tell my own family, go fill up every vehicle, because then you've got air conditioning, you've got transportation, you've got a radio. Uh, you, you, it would be a bad feeling to be stuck with a bad storm coming in and have an eighth of a tank of gas. You don't want to be in that position. So I just, I, every time I do public speaking, I tell folks, do not wait. Um, err on the side of keeping your gas tank full. Um, on recovery, FEMA does offer, uh, not benefits is the right word. They offer loans and the Small Business uh, Administration offers loans. 
I'll tell you what I've observed is that the terms of these loans for businesses and for individuals are pretty onerous. What they want to see first is that you've gone through your insurance. Um, in general, when I speak to people that do this uh, and try and get this, there's usually not a lot of payoff. It's worth remembering, I would tell everyone that after disaster, we will be publishing using Iberia pens information on how to apply for personal and business assistance. Uh, the last time we did this in 2016, the uh, fire station on, a, on Darnell Road by Highway 90 loaned us their day room and FEMA people came in and you can either call in, you can do it online, or we will have a physical place uh, opened up. This year, FEMA may not actually come in with COVID, but in general, if you're a business owner, there are FEMA benefits, but I would tell you insurance is your best option. Um, it just seems it's like getting blood from a stone to get mu much uh, money out of FEMA. It's just the way they work. Um, on 911, I'll talk about 911 for a couple of minutes. Um, the nature of 911 has really changed. Uh, when 911 started in the 80s and the 90s, we all had landlines. The way a landline phone works is your billing address is hosted in a computer in Colorado. And when you call 911 from a landline, the phone system actually queries this computer in Colorado and we know exactly where you're at. But of course, how many of us have landline phones anymore? I do, I can't do it here, but I'll ask for a show of hands. Um, typically, maybe a quarter of a group I speak to have landline phones anymore. I still do, I've thought about getting rid of it. Uh, and it's a nationwide phenomenon. The federal government has surveys you can look at. Most people just have cell phones. Well, how do we know where you are if you're on a cell phone? I get asked about this frequently. We've uh, invested a lot of time and resources in an extremely accurate map. We had a firm, they drove every road in the parish and they would stop at every single address. So whatever your home is, a few, about this is probably seven or eight years ago now, this company stopped and they made a GPS point for your address and they wrote down your number if they could read it. And that's a good point I'll come back to. So when you call from a phone and the phone location information that we, we see gets more accurate every year. The Federal Communications Commission mandates it. Um, so if, if you were in my comm center, and I've done this, uh, we had the Daily Iberian. Uh, my wife was picking up our dog at the vet. Uh, I was standing there with the reporter. I had my wife call. She was right outside the All Creatures front door. And the dot showed up within about 10 feet of where she was standing. We don't always get that close, but it's, it's quite close. We've had farmers who were concerned come in. We did a demo where you could see their tractor driver driving through the field with his phone dialed to 911. Um, so we're pretty proud of that. We've got an extremely accurate map. Parish government helps us with that. They've got a good GIS, which is Geographic Information Systems. And I'm so, so sorry for the confusion. We had a little, a little, I say. <laughs> we had a very big glitch with our Wi-Fi here at the chamber. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and jump into questions for those of us still with the program today. Um, again, I apologize for the interruption. And this first question is gonna go to Ms. Lenny Fields. Lenny? Um, okay, we've I'm got here. A, hi, we've got a question here and it says, I understand that even though my cash flow is good, I need a line of credit. Why is that? Having a line of credit made before a business or just for a consumer perspective is really good. For example, we didn't anticipate COVID, um, Avery. So if you already have a line of credit and business is slow or your husband's income is reduced because the hours are not there, um, you can tap into your line of credit. And I always encourage, as the customers come in to see us, even if they're just opening a checking account with Amy, that it is good to open a line of credit. Now, when you come see us for a line of credit and you already lost your job, it's too late. We can't approve a loan on somebody who's currently unemployed. If you have a line of credit already and you got laid off, you can tap into your line of credit make use of that while you're looking for another job and get on your back on your feet and then you know start making payments on the line of credit the same thing for business owners it is always good to have a line of credit for emergency 
or if you have receivables and collectibles that takes about 60 days to collect, you have the line of credit to tap into and then pay that off or put a big chunk to it as soon as you get your receivables and your um, 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 invoices paid. So we always encourage to have a line of credit for, for, for business owners and for consumers. Awesome. Thank you, Lenny, for answering that question. Mr. Prescott, we're going to go over to you now. We've got a question here that says, how are emergency preparedness measures expected to be impacted by COVID? It's a good question because I'm dealing with one right now, uh, dealing with our 911 center. What you find when you look at the uh, Center for Disease Control guidance on things like sheltering is literally it says something like it's really hard. Um, we, we had a discussion on this yesterday. One thing I didn't touch upon, if we have a catastrophic, a major hurricane, we have a plan for people that don't have a way to get out of town. Um, basically, we uh, have a plan to pick them up if they can't get to the sugar arena themselves. We order charter, I order charter buses. We take them to the city of West Monroe. We have an agreement with city of West Monroe. They have two facilities set aside for our people and they would run shelters there. Um, I've spoken to city of West Monroe. Um, they are looking at how they would space people out in a shelter. We've discussed uh, if we were able to get enough buses, what we would do is we would space people out on the buses. Um, but just being honest, it, there, there could easily be a point, just like you have to balance the risk of evacuating a nursing home versus staying. We may have to balance the risk of putting people on buses in order to get, themselves, get them out at a safe, you know, ahead of a storm versus the risk of putting them on a bus with other people that haven't been screened. We do have a plan to screen the people. Um, we have a stockpile of masks. So everybody that we received in a shelter or on a bus for evacuation, we would give them a mask. But an honest answer is that we will incorporate social distancing as much as we can. But the fact is that in a life or death situation for a community-wide event, we're going to have to uh, probably compromise in some ways to get people out of harm's way. So it, it's a significant impact to answer your question. And it reaches a point where there are simply limits on how much you can accommodate all these onerous COVID guidelines and still do things like an evacuation. Absolutely. Thank you for that perspective, Prescott. Now, everybody, um, the time has come for this webinar to conclude. Uh, and before we go, I want to go ahead and thank all of our lovely panelists for being here today, sharing the resources um, that you guys have available to you. I'm going to uh, go ahead and ask everyone, remind you rather, to take the 2020 census. Iberia Parish is just over 50% completion and time is running out. So go ahead to iberiachamber.org slash up next. On that resource page, you will see a link to take the 2020 census, or you can just go look it up straight online and participate. Please, if you have any suggestions for us and what you'd like to see covered in the future, reach out to us. You can always reach out to us on our website, email, or on our Slack channel. So a last call for that Slack channel, if you go to iberiachamber.org slash up next and find resources for today's webinar, um, as well as on the up next homepage, you'll be able to see a link to join our Slack channel and we look forward to continuing the conversation there. We've also, um, heard some recent updates about the Main Street Recovery Program and uh, funding that will be made available to uh, recover businesses. Uh, and so as we get updates for that, the Chamber will always make sure that you're informed on those uh, pieces of information and resources, and you can potentially look forward to a webinar covering that topic one day. And for our last announcement, unfortunately, the 2020 in-person gumbo cook-off has been canceled. Make sure you're following the World Championship Gumbo Cook-Off on Facebook for updates on how we will celebrate our favorite dish this year. This is a reminder that we will continue the conversation on Slack, a messaging platform. You can find the link to join at iberiachamber.org slash up next. Thank you for tuning in today. We can't wait to see what is in store for Iberia Parish in this path forward. 
Remember that footage from today's webinar will be made available at iberiachamber.org slash up next, as well as all of the resources that were mentioned today. If you have a suggestion for topics that you'd like to see covered, reach out to us. You can find information at iberiachamber.org on how to contact us. Be well, be safe, and have a great afternoon, everyone.